remember if I announced exact dates or what, but in the syllabus, but I think we have four plus a final or three plus a final. So at any rate, there's one probably coming up pretty soon as we finish the third week. If I was going to describe what we have reviewed so far in the semester to just kind of recap and review, um, I would say that besides some of the basic, you know, conceptual underpinnings of, you know, um, app versus um, a web app, uh, a native app versus a web app. We talked about that. Um, the big thing that we talked about, the thing that we probably spent most of our time talking about, is the different components of an Android application. All right? Programming is much different than it was when I first learned programming. When I first learned programming, you had a giant thing that was called your program. And anything that you wanted to do was in that program. All right? Uh, now, programs typically are a set of components that work together to solve a problem. And that's a much better approach, much more maintainable approach. It takes giant problems and breaks them down into tiny little manageable pieces. A uh, lot of advantages to it. Um, but there is sort of a complexity of having to learn what all the components are and having to learn how they talk to each other. All right. And really, if I was going to summarize what we've covered so far this class, it would be what the components are and how they talk to each other. All right. Um, to sort of go through them quickly, what on earth is that? That's on my laptop screen. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know where, I, where they get that image. That's not even my desktop. That's the old one too, isn't it? The, the old? Uh, just lion, I think. Set of lion. Oh, I, I don't even know. Okay, something happened there. There we go. All right, finally. Whew. All right. The components that we have so far, um, we have a bunch of resources. Um, we have four resources. We have our strings. We have our layout file, which is the main.xml. We have in our drawables any images that we have. All right. Those along with our class for our activity sort of are all the components that we, we have. All right. How do we link things together? Well, for example, in the layout, 
we can access the string file this way. So for example, the words in the upper left corner are, for this text view, come from the string file called bill total. So if we look in a string file under bill total, that's where we get that verbiage. So if we wanted to change it to say something else, would change it in the meal file and then the layout file points to that string. So that's how the string file and the layout file talk to each other. So we have those two components, that's how they talk to each other. Similar thing for drawables if we had a, uh, an image on this layout, which, which we actually don't. But, all right. Now, what we sort of left off last time was talking in more detail about how the layout and the objects in the layout are talked to by our activity class. And if you remember, we go through a process of, in our activity class, on the onCreate event, we call the superclasses onCreate event to make sure all those things happen that need to happen on that level of the, of the class hierarchy. We then set the content view. What that does, so to speak, is in, it inflates that XML file. So it takes that layout that we've described in this XML file and brings it to life. And it actually creates those objects on the heap. So we have those objects, we have uh, 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 the object for the, for the entire view, and in each view on that, we have those objects. Those exist on the heap. But, keep in mind that our activity can't really point, to, or isn't, I won't say can't, but isn't really pointing to any of them yet. All right. So we need a way to sort of hook the code in this activity to those objects which got created. And that's why we have a whole bunch of statements that look like this. Oops. Where we say tip 10 edit text equals edit text find view by ID r dot ID dot tip edit 10 text. And again, that's the ID that comes from the layout file for that the layout file. When we create those things, we add an ID called bill edit text. Well here, we actually use that to grab a pointer to that field. We cast it as the appropriate object type because again, we want to treat it as a certain object. We don't want to treat it just as a generic view. So that's how the code in our activity relates to or hooks to the objects that are created when that layout gets inflated. So now we have a whole bunch of objects in here that point to the different things in the user interface. So now we can get to work and we can actually do something. All right. Now if you remember the way this application worked, Do you remember the way this application worked? We have a text view up here, and immediately when we change that, the tips get calculated. So there's no button, there's, there's nothing like that. All right. Likewise, as we slide this bar to a different percentage of a tip, the custom tip gets recalculated. All right. So, again, we need something that links those activities to the code.
All right? We need something that links those activities to the code. And what does that is called a listener. All right? If you remember, on my simple tip calculator, we had a listener for a button. So a listener on a button responds to what? Well, it responds to the button being clicked. So we're going to need two listeners here. We're going to need a listener for the text box, and we're going to need a listener for the um, slider control, the seek bar control. And this is what we're doing here. Can we all see that, or is that hard to read? Okay. We grab our pointer to that text box, then we say bill edit text dot add text change listener bill edit text watcher. Okay. What are we doing? Well, what is bill edit text? Well, that is this text box in our in our view. Alright, in the application's view. So, we're going to take that and we're going to associate with it a listener. What does it mean when we associate with it a listener? When we associate with it a listener, that means we're assigning the code that's going to process what happens when the user does something to that control. So the code that's going to process when the user does something to that Bill Edit Text Control is called Bill Edit Text Watcher. All right. Which, if we scroll down, we'll see the code for that is here. We have a private text watcher. This name is Bill Edit Text Watcher. All right. And we have a list of stuff that happens when the user interacts with that text control. With that edit text control that this is listening for. So for example, when you do .NET programming, you have event handlers. You have code that handles a certain event on a certain control. Same idea here. The difference is, is we're actually assigning not just a method to handle that, we assign a listener object to that. So it's a slightly different way to, to do it, but it's the same idea. We assign to this bill edit text control a text listener, which is the bill edit text watcher. All right. Do you remember my simple calculator, my simple tip calculator, and how that was different than this. We didn't do it exactly this way. We actually had an anonymous class in that case. In other words, we didn't make up the class name for it. Here, here we've made up a, a, uh, an object name for it that is a text watcher. So here we actually have the file in a separate class definition. Whereas before, the class definition was part of the argument for that. Really, six of one half does the other. Frankly, I like this way better, the way we're doing it in this example. Because the other way, the code, get, the code gets very cluttered. Let me show you what I mean to contrast it. Let me bring in file, import. Let me find the simple text calculator.
Well, let me download it from Angel. Now let's go and import it. All right. If we look at how we did it in my simple text calculator, My listener, I did not refer to an object name here. I had the code embedded as the argument of that set on click listener. All right. Compare that to, in this tip calculator, where I set the text change listener, I actually put the name of an object that I have defined at another place. Six of one half does the other, right? In both cases, you're getting an object. I like this approach probably a little better because even though it creates another object, and you might say, well, that muddies the water a little bit, um, it, it keeps the code a lot cleaner. Right? Uh, in other words, here we're simply saying that we're going to set the listener to this, and we don't see the whole muck of all the other code in there like we do in this example where we have, where we set the listener and here's all the stuff that is associated with that listener. So I guess I would say that the preferred way to do it would be the way we do it in this example. Alright, so let's look at that Bill Edit Text Watcher. Alright, I don't know why they call it a watcher. I mean it's typically called listeners, but same idea. It waits and responds to events on that particular object. If we scroll down here to where that is, we'll see that it is a text watcher. So it inherits the properties from the text watcher class. All right. And on our text watcher, we override a couple methods. Two of them we don't really do anything for. One we do something for. The one that we do something for is the on text changed method. When does that method get fired off, do you think? Well, when the text in that text edit text control gets changed. That's why it doesn't like wait till we leave that field. All right. As soon as I type in a value here, the calculation gets fired off. Why does it get fired off? It gets fired off because this listener has code written on the on text changed method. All right. So as soon as we make any change to that edit text, this code fires off. Questions on what we have here so far? So, to summarize, we've associated this text watcher, this text listener, with our edit text for the bill amount. We define the specifics of that text watcher down here, which says that it's a text watcher, sure enough, makes sense. And we have some code on the edit or on the text change event, which means that it's every time the text changes that fires off. All right.
Now again, notice we're overriding it. This is code that exists in the framework. All right. Um, this code automatically gets fired off on a edit text objects text watcher that gets associated with it. So this is a text watcher for that edit text. So when that edit text gets changed, this on change event, on text change event gets fired off. We have a couple other methods that we don't do anything with really. I don't know if they're just put in there for completeness or what, but we don't do anything with those, so we're going to ignore them. So, what does this event handler do? All right, it tries to take the value in that text amount and that edit text field for the amount, and it tries to to set it to the current bill total. What's the current bill total? Well, it's an attribute on the class that relates to, you know, the amount that the bill is, the entered amount. What is S here? Notice it says double dot parse double S to string. Where does that S come from? Pardon me? It's a, it's a sequence of characters, so it's a char sequence. It's, and, and another way to, to add or to add to that is an argument to the function. So in other words, when you change that text, uh, that edit text field, this method gets called because this is a text watcher for that text field. And when it gets called, whatever characters are in the edit text field get passed to this function under the name of S. S, in other words, contains the text that is in the edit text field. All right. How does it do that? Well, you have your edit text field. This is a watcher for that edit text field. On the on change event, there's an argument of S. And that, again, that's not something I made up or something that the maker of this specific application has part of the Android framework. On a text watcher, the first argument that gets passed in on the on change event is an S, which is a sequence of characters which represents the value of that edit text field. There's some other properties, probably relates to um, you know, how many characters are in it. I'm not sure what start and before means. Maybe it indicates like where the change was made in, in the string. I'm not really sure. The one that we're really interested in is that first argument. So there's a watcher watching the actual amount? Yes. That's this line of code right here. This line of code here. We added a text change listener to that bill edit text. And what that text change listener does is, is waiting for someone to change the text. And when the text changes in that text, edit text uh, field, the on change event on that text listener fires off. So, well, yeah, we, we have to add it. We could have any number of, you know, we have to say what is going to handle when this edit when when this edit text field gets changed. So that's what we're doing here. We're saying that when this edit text field gets changed, this is the object that's going to handle it. Nope. No graphical interface for your activity file, right? That's that's this is a code. This is a Java code. And so the bill edit text watcher is an object. The bill edit text watcher is an object. It's going to contain the functions that fire off when the text box gets changed, when the edit text field gets changed, and that object is defined down here. 
is an object of type text watcher. And here's where we specify the functions. That is the code that's going to fire off, the specific code that's going to fire off. Up there we said, hey, this object is going to handle when that edit text field changes. Here is where we say, all right, what code exists for that object that when the text box changes, what code do we execute? And we execute the on text changed event, or method rather. The, Probably, yeah. Yes. No, these are the arguments to that function. In other words, text watchers are a object in the framework. They have certain methods associated with it. All right, I didn't, I didn't create or Deedle didn't create the text watcher object or class. The text watcher class is defined. And there's a method of the text watcher class called on text changed. And that method has these four arguments. Those arguments are part of the framework. These are the arguments that gets passed to this on text change method when the related edit text field gets changed. How could it? Well, no, it doesn't in ASP.NET. It doesn't generate code like this. Because it doesn't know what you're going to do with it. It doesn't even know that this text box, we want to do anything when you change it. Right? There might be, if I develop the interface a different way, there might not be, it might not fire off immediately when I type something in, but there might be a button to go and do the calculation. In which case, there is no listener for that. So, no. Uh, that stuff does not happen automatically in ASP.NET either. You code it. It might do something nice like if you double click on this, it might take you into that file and, and give you the shell of that. But again, this is handled a little bit differently. Instead of a code behind class, there's an object that's the listener for each one of the controls that the user is going to interact with. So we have this, this text watcher, which is Bill Edit Text Watcher. And again, this method is a method that's part of the framework. That's part of the ancestor that says that this method gets fired when the related edit text control gets changed. This fires off. And, and, and then this defines what we do for it. Yes? Any control that the user can interact with that we want to put some code in when they interact with it we'll have a listener. I know, uh, again, think of, think back to this, to this calculator. The simple tip calculator that I did the first example. Oops. It had a couple things. It had a spinner control, right, to say if the service was fair, good, or excellent, whatever the choices were, poor, fair, and excellent, or whatever they were. It had an edit text field, and the users could interact with them, but we didn't have any code that we wanted to fire off when those happened. All right? In other words, let's, let's go bring this guy up again. Let's bring up this example. I 
I gotta uninstall it. So, in this example, we have really three controls that the user can interact with, all right, but only one of them has a listener. We have a text box for the amount of the, of the, uh, the bill. So I can, the user can interact with it. They can go in there and put in the amount. We have a text box to, or no, I'm sorry, not a text box, but a spinner control to pick the quality of service. But none of those have listeners because we don't have any code that's going to respond to the user interacting with them. You have a listener for the interactions that you want to code something for. All right? So in this case, so th that's why I wanted to really, really clarify that no, it's not every control that the user interacts with. It's every control that the user interacts with that we want to do something in response to what they have done. So in this case, where is the listener? The listener's on the button. Because on the button, when they press the button, that's when we want to react and do something. All right? That's when we react to, uh, to, uh, and do something. So therefore... No listener on the edit text, no listener on the spinner, but a listener on the button. Because the way this problem was defined, the action that causes us to do something is the button. So that's the guy that has the listener. Now in this example, oops, we have two controls that the user interacts with we want to respond to. We have... the edit text field, <clears throat> and we have the seek bar. So in this case we have the edit text field for the bill total and we have the seek bar. Now, there's no button that says go ahead and do the calculation. Right? So as soon as I go and edit something here, as soon as I make a change to that, the calculation occurs. Why? Because we've assigned that control a listener. And we've written code in the change event, or on text change event for that listener, to go ahead and invoke the calculations. So that's why something happens there. That's why something happens here, when you drag that. All right. So let's look closer at the listener, where we were, the text watcher, what does it do? First thing it does is it tries to grab that character string. If you remember, my question was, what is S? And we decided S is an argument that gets passed to this text change event. It's just part of the framework. The framework knows that, hey, when the text changes, call this method and give it an argument of S that includes the string, the character sequence that um, is in that text box. What do we do then? Well, since that is a character sequence, we don't necessarily know that there's a number in it. We can't be guaranteed that there's a number in it. It's a character sequence, but for all we know, there could be some garbage in there. Now, I'll back up a second. Actually, we know there's only a number in there. Why? Because the edit text field we said only allows numbers. But you know what? This is one of those things of each component is only worried about its job. And this is a case of like, you know, like wearing suspenders and a belt. In other words, we put in the control and make sure you could only enter in numbers there, but we're doing some checking here as well. So if someone messed up the user interface, if someone made a change to the user interface and messed it up, 
this code wouldn't blow up then. So it's an example of, of good programming. It's, it's, in a way, you could argue that that's a little bit redundant, but it's redundant to make it a little more foolproof. So if I go in and change that text box to where is it? Edit text. If I messed that up and got rid of where I said only allowed number decimal, you know, decimal numbers in there, then this code would still catch it, all right, and cause the application not to crash. Otherwise, the application would crash at that point because we're going to try to do math on some kind of goofy string. Are you all familiar with try catch blocks? All right, try catch block again. We're going to try some statements. And if there's a problem, we're going to write some code to handle it. In this case, the only problem that we can really have here is if there isn't a number in that field. All right. Therefore, we're looking for a number format exception. That's the problem that we're catching. And if we run into these, then this function throws up his hands and says, okay, I give up. Um, we're going to just assume the bill amount is zero. I can't figure out what Fred means for a bill, you know, so therefore I'm just going to consider the bill to be zero, and then the rest of the calculations flow based on the bill being zero. All right. Questions about that? Well, it's parsed because, remember, where are we getting the value of the edit text field? Okay. It's getting passed to us as a character sequence argument in here. Okay, so the try is just pulling whatever it's putting on the Exactly. And it's going to throw the exception and set it to zero. Okay. Exactly. So, you know. This should be a number, right? Because our input, we forced a number. But if, again, if someone went and made a change and messed up the user interface and we put something goofy in there, then this instruction would try to do the conversion, fail, and would set the bill to zero. But if it could do the conversion, if we, they put in a legitimate number, then it will go and it will set current bill total to the proper value that was in the text box. All right. So at this point, we should have a current bill total one way or another. Right? Um, either it was entered as a number or our exception blew up and it gets set to zero. So we call now two methods. One to update the standard tips. In other words, the standard tips that we have, the 10, the 15, and the 20 percent. And then one to update the custom tip which is, if you remember, the custom tip was um, the, the seek bar, the percentage that's entered in the seek bar. So we do both of those. By the way, just on terminology, this is called an inner class because the class is defined inside another class. Therefore, this inner class can access the methods uh, and properties of its parent class. In other words, if you look, this current bill total way up here is defined as a private. All right, right up here, current or uh, a private current bill total. Yet this is another class, and we're still able to access it. That might be a little confusing to you and think, well, gee, this is inside another class. How can I do it? Well, this class is actually part of that class. It's not inherited from it. It's actually part of that class. And, and then the term for that is an inner class. So because of that, we can refer to the instance variables that exist on the parent class. So let's look what update standard and update custom do. Those should be pretty straightforward. Update standard simply takes the current bill total and oh, 
takes the current bill total, multiplies it by 10%, 0 0.1, then adds that current bill total and the tip to get the total total. All right, so if the meal was $100, 10% tip is $10, so now the, the grand total is $110. And then we set the text on this label to that amount formatted a certain way, formatted with two decimal points. And we set the total, total, the grand total, this amount here, to the calculation that we did where we added the tip to the meal amount to get the total. And we essentially do that three times, all right? We essentially do that little chunk of instructions three times. One for 10%, one for 15%, and one for 20%. Now, thing that you should notice, we're stuffing values into those text boxes, or those edit text fields, all right? How does it know what those edit text fields are? Well, remember, when we first created this, we set those variables by using that find ID, find view by ID. We found and we now we put we have a reference to those objects. So we can we're successfully pointing to those objects. Alright? Hmm? Yes. And if you remember right. And again, I don't, you know, I mean, there are a million ways to do anything, but they actually keep you from editing it by saying that it's not focusable. So, this is the same kind of edit, this is an edit text field, this guy right here. But not really, because I can't go into that field. And the reason I can't go into it is because they set focusable to false. So I can't go into it. Well, one second. In other words, the, 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 the punchline here, if you will, is that they want it to look like a text box. All right? They wanted to let, have a border around it and look like an edit text field, but they didn't want people to actually enter data in. So they made it an edit text and they said, hey, you can't have focus to it. Yes. Okay. I'm thinking if I was going to do this, I would have I would have done it in a text view, not an edit text view. Yes. Repeat that, please. I think they want it to look like a a text box with the border around it. That would. Yeah, in other words, if you're going to compare this bill total, let me, let me use a pen to point. This bill total, this tip, and this total, all those are regular text views. These are edit text views. This is a, in other words, this is a text view, this is an edit text view. Now, is there a way to style a text view to make it, to have a border and make it look like it? There probably is, but I don't know how to do it off the top of their head. And I'm guessing the person that wrote this doesn't know how to do it off the top of their head. Because <laughs> they, uh, they obviously took the easy way out and says, okay, I'll put it in uh, edit text view and I'll just we'll make it not editable. All right. Back to this. So we've updated sort of the standard tips. That is, that is, we have updated the, the, the table that has the 10, the 15, and the 20 percent. We also called update custom. And update custom, we take the instance variable that's defined as custom current percent or current custom percent rather, I'm sorry. We set the text and we do the calculation to calculate the current bill total times custom tip amount and then set 
the text box. Now you might ask how that custom percent gets set. Well, we haven't talked about that yet. It gets initialized when we initially load this, that custom percent gets initialized to 18%, right? Because if you remember, when we first opened the application, that seek bar was at 18%. <clears throat> um, and then that number gets adjusted as we use our finger to slide around that text bar, all right? Uh, or that seek bar, I mean. Um, so we haven't seen the code that sets that variable yet. But we know that it's going to do its job. It's going to set this attribute. I'm sorry, this attribute. Current custom percent. And then this update custom can do its job. And take the percentage um, that has been selected using the seek bar. Multiply it by the new bill amount that we just entered and come up with a new custom tip amount. Questions about this? No. This is, a, this, is an acti this is one activity. There can be multiple activities per app. I'm not sure what you mean by one page. Well, no, not necessarily. If you remember my my tip example, I actually ha I think maybe you're asking, um, will there be one class per activity? And the answer is no. They can be. Oh, because there could be there could be dozens of classes. That would be if there. There's a good thing there isn't, because that would have to come with like a giant bottle of ibuprofen and, and a magnifying glass and something, right? Because if you imagine having so, you know, this is just a very simple application with just one activity uh, that just does everything in the one class. But if you can imagine, like in this one, I have two classes. If you imagine a bigger app that actually has several screens, all right, and there can be like problem domain classes in addition to the UI and the activity classes, you could be into a bunch of classes. And to view all the code for a bunch of classes at once, you wouldn't be able to make sense of it. So you could write a Unix shell script to concatenate all of them together and look at it, right? You could help if he's having trouble with that. Uh, but uh, to actually, to, within the GUI, no, there isn't. And it really wouldn't do you any good to do that. I'm not really sure why you would ever even want to do that. Yeah, and the whole idea of it is, is, is actually, um, if I remember right, uh, one of the rules of thumb given for folks for developing a good method is if you develop a good method, it shouldn't take up more than one screen's worth because then you can get your head around it and see the beginning and the end of the method all on one screen. All right? And if you have to scroll a bunch to see the whole method, then your method's probably long and you probably should break it off into other method. The whole beauty of this being in components and all that is that at a certain point, I can say, hey, I know that user interface is created correctly. I don't need to look at that code. All right? I can focus on just the piece of it that I need to focus on. Or like in my simple tip calculator, if we were going to build upon that and maybe do more with the meal object, I could, if, if that meal object was perfected, let's say and it had a bunch, of you know, a bunch of methods in it, a bunch of other things in it, it's encapsulated. So I can sort of say, I know that part does its job. All I have to do is make sure I call the right methods on it and get the right, right results. I don't need to worry about the details of it. That's why in my mind, again, why I said that I think actually this 
is a better way to do it, to set the listener, for the very reason of, hey, if I'm not interested in the details of what happens in that listener, I don't have to see them. Alright? If I'm not working on that part, it's not cluttering the picture. That object does its job, you know, I'm okay with that. I don't have to see it unless there's some reason for me to need to go into it and take a look at it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what, I, 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 I think you're talking about just of the GUI. Yeah. Yeah, that would show you the GUI, but again, that wouldn't really show you the graphical layout. That wouldn't really show you, yeah, that wouldn't really show you uh, the code behind it. That just shows you the, the user components. Well, not really, because that takes you to the code in the XML. That doesn't take you like to the code of the listener or anything. Yeah. Yeah. How would you get to the code of the listener? You just click on that and it you there. Yeah, you'd go and look through the code in the, in the activity and find where the listener is. There, there's, nothing, there's nothing that, there's no shortcut to go from the uh, GUI to the the code that handles it, the listener, if that's what you're asking. I think, and again, I, I think you were asking about it last time, and I think the answer was the same last time. No, there's nothing. <laughs> you have to go and look at the code. Yeah, yeah. All right. So we have one more piece of this application to finish up. And that is that seek bar. Now, we've, we'll, the, the idea is going to be very much the same. All right, we're going to we're going to assign a listener to that seek bar. All right, so we're going to we're going to assign an object that handles what happens when someone moves their finger along the seek bar. And that's what we're doing here. We point to the seek bar, right, using the same technique we used all the other ones. We find the thing on the ID that has, oh, I'm sorry, we find the thing on the view that has the ID that we're interested in. And then we're setting the on seek bar change listener to custom seek bar listener. Well, what's custom seek bar listener? That is... this thingy right here. And again, it's going to look a lot like the text, the edit text listener, right? Instead of being a, a, a text change watcher, it's going to be an on seek bar change listener. And instead of doing the text change method, there's going to be on seek bar change. Or on progress change, I'm sorry. Now, in this case, the custom percent is stored in the seek bar's get progress attribute. Now, a seek bar is a, a sort of a natural for percentages because a seek bar, the range of values in it goes from 0 to 100, right, which co can correspond to percents. So in other words, as we slide this guy around, all the way over this way is zero. All the way over that way is a hundred. You know, in the middle is going to be fifty some. I can't get it right in the middle, but you know, this will be in a neighborhood of ten, and so on. So there's an attribute of the seek bar. called get progress and we simply take that attribute whatever it is and stuff it into the custom current percent attribute and then we say go ahead and update custom now, there's no need for us to go and update the, the the standard ones right because those are those don't change those only change when you change the amount 
What changes here is the custom tip and the custom calculation. So we go and we do that calculation. We take it, divide it by 100 or multiply it by 0.01 to get that, take that integer and change it to a decimal expression of the percent. Then we do the calculation. Now again, do notice this. Remember with the listener, we had a character sequence S. That was the argument that we were interested in because that was the argument that says the text in the change control. This progress changed, the argument that we get is a seek bar and therefore we execute this seek bar get progress. And that gives us a numerical value between 0 and 100 by default, that is. I'm sure we can tweak the progress bar to show different numbers, but 0 to 100. And um, uses that as the current percentage. Now, why no try-catch here? Why don't I have to do a try-catch here like I did with the string? Yeah, because the seek bar can't possibly return anything but a number. All right, That attribute is always going to be a number. So there's nothing I could do in my GUI to break that. There's something I could do in my GUI to break that validation that I only enter a number in there. Right? I could, I could get rid of that, that uh, data format or whatever it was called. And they could enter in other stuff in there. But there's nothing I can do to a seek bar to, to change it from um, being a number. And then again, we just call that method and away we go. Now, I lied. <laughs> there is one more thing in this application I want to look at. We kind of, we half looked at it last time. All right. But uh, we kind of blew past it. And that is the whole idea of what if we do this? All right, we're doing this. Okay, well, let's see. I want to check to see what the weather is. It's not 50 degrees. It's also not February 12th. All right, bottom line is I go through here, then I go back to my tip calculator. And if you notice, everything is back to where it was. How does that happen? Well, that happens through some events that fire off, all right, to save an instance and to save some data. And these events fire off automatically on an activity. And what we do is we created a onSaveInstance method that overrides the superclasses. And we're going to stuff those two things to remember them later. We store in our little bundle that is our current state that we're going to output, so they call it out state, the current bill total, and we give it the name bill total. If you remember, those were the constants that we had talked about before. All right, the, 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 the private static, final, blah, blah, blah. These are constants. So we're going to store the bill total under the name of bill total, and we're going to store the percent under the name of percent. All right? So when someone goes and like deactivates this application to go do something else, it's going to go and remember that somewhere. And then when we come back, it is going to restore those. All right? If you remember, we saw this last time. The very first time the application executes, the current bill total is considered to be zero, and the custom percentage is to be 18%. Otherwise, when it's being restored, we take the last value that was saved. So it's just a nice way to remember stuff so it didn't restart each time. If we were to eliminate this, let's eliminate these lines of code.
Let's see what happened. Or actually, let's not eliminate these. Let's eliminate where we save it. I'm just going to cut this out for now. Oops. All right, it initializes the same way it did before with 18% and zeros. But if I do some entering in and moving that around, then I go and check the weather for February and then go back. Well, I lied. It's still that anyhow. I guess I'm not 100% sure then when those, um, when that save instance happens. That could be. I'm not sure. That's a good question. I guess I was mistaken about that. Yeah, I suppose. It could be that I'm not thinking this through completely. Obviously, I'm not thinking something through completely. Okay. Questions about anything that we saw today? One thing I had intended to do today, I don't know if I want to try to rush it in the last eight minutes or so, is go through some scenarios of like, if I wanted to change this, what would I have to do? All right. Um, I'm thinking we can do that next time when we have more time to, to, uh, to, to discuss it and, uh, and go through it. Questions about this or any of your assignments or anything? All right. We'll see you up in lab then. We have a couple folks going to lab, I assume. <laughs>